Hello, my name is Ryan from Buster Beagle 3D, and today I have something a little different for you guys. Today I'll be reviewing the 3D Maker Pro Mole 3D Scanner. It is a compact but powerful 3D scanner with a 0.05 millimeter accuracy, a 0.1 millimeter resolution, and has the option to take your 3D scanning mobile in the field. So how does it work? Is it really that easy to use and do I like it? Well, let's find out. Now, some of you may or may not know that my actual profession is a 3D modeler. I have been doing it for over 20 years now, so the prospect of 3D scanning has always interested me. So much so that I bought a 3D scanner over a decade ago, which was not only super expensive, it was terrible. So bad that I couldn't even scan the test object that came with it. So I returned it. Jumped to today, and I was offered to review this Mole 3D scanner by 3D Maker Pro, and I was more than a little hesitant to give it a try. Well, spoiler alert, the experience could not have been more night and day. Just take a look at all the models that I have scanned with the machine so far. These are all the raw data scans straight out of the JM Studio software that I scan the objects in. There has been no post work done by me to these files. What you see is what I exported straight out of the software. Okay, so before I go too far into the results that you can get and how to achieve those results, I wanted to go over what you get in the box. First, you will see that this comes in a new rigid case to keep everything nice and secure. You then have the scanner itself that you can see fits nicely in my hand, so it works great in handheld mode that I'll talk about in a little bit. Then, if you get the premium kit, it also comes with this motorized rotating table that also has an easily trackable base that sits on top of it when you're using it in tabletop mode. It also has a folding tripod with an extension, as well as all the necessary wires and plugs. It even comes with plugs for multiple countries in case you want to do some traveling and scanning around the world. There is also a luxury version that will allow you to capture color textures for your models, but unfortunately I do not have that but I will show you the models that I scanned where I was able to add some textures. And lastly, there is an optional device called the Connect that will allow you to take the mole away from your computer where you will be able to use an app on your smartphone to capture the cloud point data. That is how I was able to scan this little statue outside. Now, the Mole 3D scanner is intended for small to medium items. It uses an NIR or near-infrared laser that can not only work in the dark, but is also safe for your eyes. The mold typically doesn't require any trackers as well. I was able to work with it from this little dinosaur toy all the way up to the statue and everything in between. Now, there are a few things that this scanner is not intended for. It cannot scan hair or objects that have thin, tiny waves and tiny holes. It also does not work on untreated shiny, clear, or black objects. You can take a look at this Donald picture frame holder, and you can see that everything scanned perfectly except for that black tassel on his hat or his eyes. Now, there are ways to fix this, but it does require some adjustments to the model. To be able to 3D scan things like this glass vase or even dark black areas on this portable heat gun, you need to do something to coat those areas so the laser scanner can see them. There are professional sprays that you can use specifically intended for this purpose that spray on and then automatically evaporate off the models after a certain number of hours. However, at $40 a bottle, that was really not an option I wanted to try out. I then remembered a trick that I use with laser engraving with glasses and tempura paint and a cheap airbrush. Tempura paint is not only cheap, you can buy it at the dollar store in many places, and it also washes off super easy, so it's not permanent on any of the objects I've tried it on. I just mixed the tempura paint with a little water and lightly sprayed it on the surface of my objects. It does a really great job of coating the surface and getting a great scan. Again, after you are done, you can just rinse it off with water and you're back to new. 
The last coating that I read about on Reddit was this CVS foot powder spray. Now initially I hated it since it seemed to go everywhere with my makeshift paint booth, but part of the issue was that I was trying to go too thick too fast. I ended up giving it another shot later on with a better paint booth and was pretty happy with the results. It sprays on wet and then dries and coats everything in a powder and does a great job of allowing the mold to track. Also, at about $9 a bottle, it was much more reasonable than the $40 spray, but does require a little more effort to dust it off later. I wanted to kind of go over the software and, and how this all works. I'm going to be using this little statue here. It's kind of an inception moment because I used the machine to create this and then I 3D printed it. This is a little statue that's outside, but I thought it'd be a good test for showing how this scanner works. I'm going to open up the software. When you first open this initially, it's going to have you add your scanner, but obviously I already have mine added. You just follow the steps and then it'll bring you into the main software. You always get this quick start guide. You can turn it off in the settings if you want, but it kind of goes over the user interface, tells you what everything is. Then it tells you about objects that require special treatment before you do any scanning. This is giving you kind of a guide. It's over here. This is a, a distance adjustment. You want everything to be in this excellent range and, and you'll see this move as the model moves and you'll see where it, it'll tell you whether you're too far or you're too close. That'll make a little bit more sense later. And then it tells you about the turntable. Again, I have the premium model. It came with this particular turntable. It's giving you some tips for that. And then lastly, it'll give you some shortcut keys that you can use while using this software. You can see it's immediately putting me in this easy scan mode. And there's three modes up here. There's easy scan, table scan, and edit mode. When you're in easy scan, for whatever reason, you don't have access to any of the file menus up here. I'm just going to click on table scan real quick, just so I can show some of these. Here's where you can add or open old projects. Uh, you can import cloud data into here. You can export your mesh out of here. And one of the things that you'll do when you first set up your camera is you have to import a calibration. And this is how it's going to connect your mole scanner to your computer. You'll see a QR code here. This is also what you're going to use later on when I'm talking about when you're using the mobile version of the Connect. When you go to connect your scanner to the app, it'll say to scan your QR code. And this is what it's talking about here. It's, it's talking about this QR code. And all this QR code is, is a QR code of your serial number. We'll have edit mode which is the last mode. And this is once we finally have a scan. Again, the two types of scan is easy scan and table scan. If we were using easy scan, and let's say we weren't using this table, you can see this little blue section turning up here. And this is giving you a preview of what you're seeing over here. If I was to tilt this down, you'll see that I can start to see my model on the table itself. And you can also see where it's showing that my distance is excellent. Now let me just tilt this down. This is also where you can just, you know, hold this in your hand and, and not use a tripod. But if you'll notice over here, and I'm going to make this larger, you'll see that all of this area is red in here. And what that means is that it's too bright. The near infrared laser that's pointing at the model, it's getting too much of a reflection back from the surface. That's why you can come over here and set these adjustment values of the brightness. What you want to do is just lower this down until most of that red is gone. Right underneath that is sensitivity. And that's pretty much talking about the, the overall sensitivity of the laser. The reason you might want to adjust this either higher or lower is if you have some of those kind of darker objects. What I'm going to be doing initially on this one is the table scan. I'm going to move this into the center, plug it in. This will rotate. And what I'm going to do here is click on preview. We see pretty much where the model is going to be. And you can see over here that for the most part, my range from the model is excellent. But I'm going to tilt it down just a little bit to 
kind of put it more in that range. And you see that when I have it more centered to what the laser is seeing, I'm getting a better graph here and it's telling me that it's excellent positioning from the laser. I'm going to click this again. What this initial is, is it wants to scan this base without the model on it. And it uses that later on to delete the base that the only thing that we're left with is the model. I'm going to take the model off and then I'm going to click on initial. This is just scanning that base just by itself. There's nothing else on there. And the thing is, you don't have to let this run forever. It'll just keep going. You know, you try to get just some idea of the base of this, and then you can just click it again. It'll stop, but it'll have recorded where you put that base. I'm gonna put this model back on, and I'm gonna click scan. Everything that is the green is what it's really capturing at the moment and then the blue is what it has already captured. Right now, this is going by frames, and it'll go to just over 300 frames, and then it'll automatically stop. And then it'll rebuild its point cloud data. Here's what you're left with. Whatever is pink are the point data that is selected. Everything that is blue here, because you can see over here I have this layer, now it says table scan because this was a table scan. And the thing is you can combine table scans and easy scans with the same model. This is telling me that I have a table scan one over here. And again, everything that is selected is what it thinks it can throw away. But you can see it's picked up a little bit of the model that I don't necessarily want to throw away. And so I'm gonna come over to here and these are the selection tools. And I like to use the rectangular selection tool. One thing that I'm gonna mention right here is there are a couple of ways to view this model. If I come over to tools and then go to projection mode, you see I have perspective and then I have parallel mode. Perspective is exactly that. You see everything in perspective. And parallel is you'll see everything more orthographic or you know everything is much more flat and then I'm just hitting shift to rotate scrolling the the middle mouse button to go in and out and you'll see all of the guides up here as to what all the buttons do what I want to do is I want to deselect this section right here I'm going to hit alt and I'm going to click over that and you'll see that I've deselected that particular part of the scan data and I'm just gonna hit delete. It's deleted most of the base, uh, but I still have all of this data around here because I, I deselected some of those things. I could just hit control and then select all of that stuff again, just by panning around and grabbing it. Some of this stuff will go away by itself uh, when you do some noise removal, but I like to help things out by deleting it beforehand. I'm just selecting everything and deleting. Obviously, with this with this first scan, you can see that I'm missing a lot of sections, and it's just things that the laser or the scanner couldn't see. But the next thing that I want to do is I want to append because I want to add more scans to this project. I'm going to click append, and then I'm going to take the model, and then instead of having it upright, I'm going to put it down on its face so that it's sticking up. If you've moved the camera, or let's say you had a really tall object, you can go back to the preview mode and the initial mode. But since I haven't moved anything but the model, I don't have to go back to those steps. And also, if I wanted to at this point, I could use the easy scan and not use the table scan. But I'm going to stick with the table scan for right. And I'm going to click scan. And again, it'll go through the 320 frames which is roughly how long it takes for one revolution of this scanner bed. All right, we're back into edit mode. I'm gonna see what it took away. I think that did a pretty good job. There's, there's some data down there. I could try to save that. I am going to alt drag. Just preserve that data. Hit delete. Now you'll notice that there's points here, but 
it almost seemed like when I was scanning, I was getting more points. If you come over to your layers tab here and you right click on the layer, you see how it says show keyframes. You can also go where it says show all frames and it'll show you every frame that it generated when it was doing its scan. And you'll notice that there's a little bit more data there than was previously there. I like to many times go in and clean that up. When you bring in this next scan, it will automatically hide the first scan. I'm going to show that first scan again, and I'm gonna show all frames for that one as well. But you'll notice because I've turned this, they're not in the same place anymore. What I need to do is align these two things. What I could do is I could do it manually or they have an auto function for this. I'm just gonna see how well it automatically does it without me having to do the manual process and see what I get. I'm just gonna hit align with the two layers visible. And you can see it does a pretty good job of aligning these two things. And now I, I know it looks messy, right? But the, again, this is just scan data. This is not mesh data. A lot of this stuff will get cleaned up later on. But you see, I'm still missing some of these sections in here. I'm going to append another scan. Append. And then this time I'm just going to flip it over. Hit scan again. That looks pretty good. Looks like I have most of the parts in there. Hit delete. I'm gonna show all frames. And it's these kind of things that are kind of the outliers that I like to get rid of. That the, the computer doesn't have to think about these things when it goes to assemble all of these points. So I'm just control selecting and delete. And I'm gonna bring back my other two models and I'm going to hit align again. So this did a pretty good job of aligning everything. I don't have to go into manual mode for this one. I might do it in a second just to show you the process of this. I think that looks pretty good. I think I have pretty good coverage everywhere. I have a little bit of a section missing on the bottom here. It's on the bottom of his hand. I think I might do another scan where I try to prop it up on the other side that I can get some of this other data down here. Some of this will, will just come in automatically. It'll fill in these areas, but just for a full scan, I'm gonna run one more. And I don't know if there is a, a limit to how many scans that you can run. Obviously, the more scans you have, the longer it takes to compile it. But, you know, I've had probably 10 scans and it, it seemed to be just fine. Looks like we have pretty much everything covered. If we come over here, we'll see that we have fusion, remove noises, repair and simplify. We also have this texture mapping, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. I just want to remove noise, repair any holes, and then I'm gonna simplify this model to about 200,000 faces. I'll click all of the buttons that I want to use, and then it'll only process the ones that you have visible. If you turned off any of these layers, it won't process those particular layers. I'll turn them all on and hit process. It'll ask you to name it. Little statue and hit apply. It'll save the project. It'll say that this is the data that is going to be processed. We'll hit apply. There is a little scan of our little scan. There's another mode that we can do, and it's called the texture mode. Instead of just looking for geometry, 
it will start to flash and look for the textures as well. If I had the additional color kit, this is where I could use the external texture mapping, but I don't have it. The only thing that I can do is create a texture in black and white, but I'll show you what it looks like. If you hit preview, you'll see that the camera starts to flash. In here, you can start to see a more detailed picture of what of what the model looks like because it's recording or it's it's looking for that texture data if i again take my model away for the initial and you'll notice that even on this section that it's recording it's recording not only the geometry but you see that it is in black and white also recording the texture I'm going to stop that, and just for fun, I'm going to put that dinosaur that I was talking about earlier on here. I'm just going to append it. And I still have the texture mode on, my sensitivity is really high, and I'm just going to scan it. Again, the, the, the texture for these are in black and white. You're not going to see the color unless you have the, the scan kit. And even then, I'm not sure that you see the, the data in color. Delete. I'll show all frames. Again, this might be a little difficult to see because, again, it is black and white. But there is some color data on there. Without going too far into this one, I'm just going to... I'm going to process this one just so you see the color that shows up. So... I can click over here. If I click on this little cube in the top, I can get to the process tab. And I am going to fusion. I'll remove noise, repair, simplify. And then in this instance, I want to use that texture mapping. And I'm going to process. Again, this isn't really for this model or how good it is, but you can see that even with that single scan, it did a pretty decent job. And you can start to see some of the textures, at least in black and white, that were on this model on the top, which aren't half that bad. All of this orange section is where it tried to repair, where it's trying to fill in the holes or the gaps that, that it couldn't figure out. But if you look at the model that I have in here, this texture that is on this currently is that black and white texture. And then I, I saw in another video that somebody just took that black and white texture and ran it through Photoshop's neuro filter and it gave me this color. But the, the basis of this texture is that black and white texture inside of the program. This is if you have this particular table, it'll rotate it for you. But let's say that I wanted to do this statue, but I wanted to not use the table scan. I wanted to just use the easy scan mode. I'm going to remove this. I just have a, a handheld unit. And so what I want to do is I want to click on easy scan. I'm going to turn off the texture because it's not something I really need. And then also an easy scan, you can change it to, to fine texture quality. I'm just going to switch that over to fine. And there is my model. Let me see if I can do this where you can see it on camera. There we go. In handheld mode, I can just click on scan or press spacebar. And then I can just move this scanner to the object. And you can see where I'm moving it. It is recording it. You'll see if I get down too far, it'll say I'm too close. If I back up too far, it'll say I'm too far. And this is essentially doing the same thing as the table scan. It's just not rotating. And this one, the table scan will go for the 320 frames. 
this one will go, I, I don't know how far it'll go because I've never let it go above like 1200. Uh, but it'll just keep going until you tell it to stop. Another thing that you can do is, let's say you have this on a turntable, as long as you can put your hand in and you're not in the, in the view of the, the frame of the laser, you can start to rotate your model. It's not seeing your environment, it's only attaching it to what it can see. Just with my hand, I'm rotating that table. I'm just going to slowly turn that. And again, I'm just holding this with my hand. And then once I feel like I got a good scan, I can either click on the scan or hit spacebar, which is nice and convenient. Put this back. And obviously the, the longer you go, the longer it's going to take for the software to rebuild the model. The nice thing about the easy scan is again, you can add as many frames to it as you want. You can kind of finesse around objects. It, you don't have to stay looking from a particular vantage point. Uh, as long as you go fairly slow and you're careful about where you're picking things up from, it does a, a pretty good job for me show all frames to make sure I don't have any straggler pieces. Select all these and delete. I'm going to run the process on this just to show how kind of good this can be with a single scan. Delete some of this. And it doesn't matter that there's holes, those will get closed up. Even on the bottom, that'll get closed up. Remove noise, repair, and simplify and process. And there you go. And you can see even from that one scan, this did a pretty good job of, of putting this all together. If you'll notice here on his hand, it's got this little section where there was just a little bit extra data there that was potentially not needed. One of the things that you can do there is I could come in over here and I can make selections on this mesh the same way that I was making selections on the point cloud data. If I come over here and I select this by hitting shift and I select that, this might be a good instance where I use the that lasso tool. I can select those things. Here's another one that I didn't see before. And then Alt to deselect. I can hit delete. It'll remove those, but you see that we have some of holes here. I'm going to delete more of this. But again, I can run any of these processes individually. I don't have to run all of them at the same time. I can come up to here, edit and repair. And it'll fill those holes in. Again, this was, this was just a, a quick test. You would never probably do this off of just a single scan, but you can see that even with that single scan data, it did a pretty good job. One of the dialog boxes that showed up when we did this was reorienting your model. And, and I didn't click it at the time, but over here in the top right corner, there is a reorient. If you click on that, you'll see these three points that show up. And what these are, are it's trying to ask you where the bottom of your model is. So what you do is you rotate it and then you right click on the dot and then you pick a point on the bottom of your model. I'm right clicking on a point on the bottom of my model. So I'll do the same thing with the two and then the same thing with the three. And now you can see that it's 
created a triangle on the bottom of the model. And you'll see this arrow pointing up. It's saying, hey, this is the top, not the other side. If this, for whatever reason, this triangle is, is facing down, there's a flip direction button over here. So you can just flip the direction. But this is correct. I want it facing up. And you say reorient. And it's going to allow you to save the rotation of your model in which direction you want it to face. I'm going to rotate it just so that he's looking forward and apply. And this model is, is sitting flat the way that you would, would assume that it would. Even if you rotate it, it doesn't matter. You're just rotating the viewport. When I go to export it, this is the bottom. I'm just going to start a new project. All right, I'm going to go for a table scan preview. I'm going to do the initial. All right, so I have a couple different scans of this head. And if I was to show them all, none of them line up. If I hit a line, let's see if they go together. If for whatever reason, the, the faces don't go together or your models don't go together, you'll see that it looks like it put two of them together, but the last one didn't work. One of the things that you can do is only show two at a time. The first and second one seem to align pretty well. If I wanted to align this third one, I could turn off the first one, turn on this last one, and then try to run the alignment again with just the, the two together. And again, I couldn't put them together. There's two things that you can try. The first thing you can try is to manually move this green head that it's facing in the right direction. And the way we do that is we click on this button over here on the, on the left, says Enable Transform Operator. And when that is clicked, I can click on the, the green section here, and then while holding down Alt, I can try to rotate. You'll see what it's doing here is it's moving the wrong one. And this is something that I that hopefully if the programmers of this program are listening, uh, it would be nice to be able to always tell which one you were going to be moving. Even though I have the green one selected, it moved this one, which I didn't want it to do. What you can do is, let's say I move this face to where it's facing forward. I can turn off that other one and then hit alt and move this one so when i'm hitting alt here i'm i'm moving the face i'm not rotating around it if i was to turn on that other face you can see they're looking in the same direction if you hit the middle mouse button and alt then it moves it side to side what what i like to do sometimes is just kind of get it situated as well as i can it's kind of got a weird rotation to it, so you kind of have to feel it out until you get it right. It would be nice if there was some sort of gimbal that would allow you to turn it, and then I'm just going to move it close to where I think it should be. And again, you see, even though I, I meant to grab the green one, I'm grabbing the wrong one. It'd be nice if there was a way to, to isolate the one that you were selecting. I'm going to see if that's close enough, and then I'm going to try to do the align again. But it's still not working. The auto align is not going to work for this particular instance. I need to go to the manual route. I'm going to show everything. And then instead of using this auto align, I can click on manual align. When I click on manual align, it's telling me to drag one item to a line. I'm going to take this table scan 10. 
I'm going to drag it up to the top and that'll put it in this top window here. And then I just need to pick another version, either the table scan eight or the table scan nine. I'm just going to click on the nine. Let's see, what is the eight? I'm going to do the eight because there's more points to that one. And we're just going to zoom in. And here, what we're trying to tell it is where the two models align. I'm going to click on this little plus under mark point. And then just like I was doing when I was reorienting the part, I need to right click on the mouse to click on the button. And then I'm going to find a section that I can find on both models. Right here, I'm just going to pick this part of the eye. And then over here, I'm going to right click on the one and then pick kind of the same section on the eye. For two, I'm going to pick this part of the ear. Two, so here. And you can move it around if you don't have it quite right. Sometimes it's hard to find exactly the right spot. Another thing, again, you can show all frames and it'll give you more of that model. The third spot will be my receding hairline. With all of those points picked, you can then click on Align. And it should have put those two together. There you go. It's a lot of extra garbage in this one. It'll go away. Right. Now you can see that this table scan nine is now out of out of order i'm going to drag that one in here and i'm going to align that to the table scan eight i'm not exactly sure how this sets everything up in the lineup. Sometimes I feel like when I try to do the the items in order, it'll align it to one and then not align it to the other. I feel like you have to go through the process with each one. I'm going to try it again from table scan nine to table scan 10. It looks like we finally have all of the models in the same direction. There we go. From here, if I went to process, pair and simplify. If you were doing the process with textures, you would want to run all of these processes except the texture mapping. And then that's when you're going to go in here. You're going to select some photos. You're going to crop something and then cut and it'll, it'll crop the pictures that it has taken and then apply them to your model. I, I haven't been able to test that because I don't have that, that attachment, but that's how you would 
add textures to your model. So once you're done, you would just come over and export. You can export as an OBJ, a PLY, or an STL, and then use it in your program of choice. First thing I tried was this little dinosaur. It was the first test of the scanner and it did pretty good. I don't think I had dialed in the correct sensitivity for this object and I was having a little trouble with the alignment of the scans. Now to be fair, with all of the appendages and spikes of this model, it isn't an easy model to scan, especially as a first try. It was actually only after scanning with textures that I seemed to get a really good and alignable scan. You can see here that it turned out pretty nice. Again, this camera can scan textures, but only in black and white. You need the optional kit to scan in color. I then took the texture, exported out of the software, and using Photoshop's colorization neural filter, I was able to add some color to the black and white image. So that's why you see the color texture on this model. The second thing I scanned was this little 3D print of my head. This was one of the easiest things that I scanned with the mole, and it really did a great job with the white plastic PLA. It did a good job of scanning and putting everything together. It was probably the quickest of all my scans. The next model I tried was this picture frame holder of Donald Duck. This was a little bigger model, so it had to be done in sections. It was also a very easy model to put together as there are many unique features that are easily trackable. The only issue with this model is those black areas that I mentioned before. The scanner does not handle those black parts, so I would have benefited from coating those sections with sprays to make them show up better. Overall, I thought it was a nice scan that turned out great. Fourth model was this hanging bracket for a vacuum cleaner. Now this model had a host of issues working against it. First was the color, so it had to be painted to have the scanner see it at all. The second issue was that other than the holes on one side of the part, it's pretty symmetrical, so the app had issues aligning the parts since it doesn't see the holes on one side as a feature, but just as areas that didn't scan. That is why I attached this little square knob to one side so that I could tell which side was which. The last issue is all of those deep holes. It's not easy for the scanner to make out all those deep and complete pass-through holes in this model. It's amazing that it was able to see any of it and reconstruct it with the pass-through holes at all, but this was a model that took some time and trial and error to get even to this point. Again, not too bad given what this model is, but it would need some post work for sure. The fifth model was this little crystal vase. I coated the glass in a white tempera paint and it seemed to work pretty good. You will also notice that I like to prop up some of my models with screws so it floats above the turntable. This is a quick and easy way to make sure that I can delete the turntable points later in the software, and also because the screws are shiny metal, they are almost completely invisible to the laser. The sixth model was this little crocodile hunter toy that I have. This model was a bit tricky and did require some effort to get scanned and aligned correctly. With so many angles and intertwined appendages, it took some work to get it just right. In the end, however, I think it turned out as one of my favorite models. Next, I tried this music statue, and again, much like the Donald picture frame from before, it has to be scanned in sections, but came together quite nicely. The only issue I had were the eyes, because they were black, and they were also a lot of shiny embossing on the object, but I promised my daughter that I would not spray it with anything, so this will have to do. Overall, a really great model as well. Next, I wanted to scan this old school label maker. At first, I scanned this model and it was missing the entire back section since that part is semi-transparent. The laser just couldn't pick it up. This was when I tried that foot powder spray again since I decided to give it a second shot and it did really well. With just a light coating of spray, it really made the model show up great for the scanner. Next, I tried the foot powder spray again on these pneumatic buttons that I use in my injection molding machines, and again, the result turned out really nice. I remember having to model these buttons before for a project, and it would have been great to have this 3D scanner back then to give me this model. Same thing was true for the next model, which was this vise. 
this was another object that I had to measure and 3D model previously, and it would have been so much easier with this 3D scanner. Now, this one was heavy, so I didn't put it on that small turntable, but I added it to my own heavy duty turntable. I also didn't clean the vise before spraying it with the foot spray, so some of the grease and dirt made the powder not stick, so there were a few areas with issues. Also, the scanner has some issues with the thread on the screw and the shiny knobs, but overall a decent starting point of recreating this model for sure. It was also done in many sections and put together in the software. Next, I used the mobile connect attachment to take the scanner outside to use it away from my computer. I attached everything to the pieces that came with the connect and took it outside. One quick note here is that you have to power the device with an external power supply. I used a battery charger for my iPhone and it worked just great. The battery does not come with the connect kit so you need to make sure you have one to plug it in. The only other gripe I have about this kit is the way that you have to hook up your iPhone to the app. They do provide this little cord to attach the phone to the Kinect, but the issue is, is that the app only works in one direction on your phone, meaning that you have to put the phone in the clamp with the lightning port on the opposite side of the port on the Kinect. And then this cord barely reaches from the port on the Kinect to your phone. You also can't just switch the mole in the phone positions since you need the extra room on the front for the connection to the mole. Just a small gripe, but if anything, they should orient the app on the phone so that it's the other way. Anyway, I went outside and used the app to collect the scan data for this statue. I unfortunately don't have video of me crawling around on the floor capturing this model since I use my iPhone to film most of my videos, but I did capture the screen on my phone while I was scanning. The scanning seems to go pretty smooth, and then you just take all of those scans and then import them back into the software on your PC for processing. You just go to File, Import for Mobile, and then using the QR code, you connect your phone to your computer and transfer the data over. I did that and was able to transfer the data over, and it drops into your workspace folder, and then under upload files on your machine that can be imported into your project. I then processed the data just as I would if I had scanned on my desk and got a really nice model. It wasn't perfect at the feet as it was surrounded by little stones, but it did pretty nice. I then threw this into a software package called ZBrush to add a little bit more geometry to the feet and then flatten it out. I'm sure there's plenty of other free programs I can do the same thing. The next thing I wanted to try with this model was to add some color. Now again, I don't have the color kit that you can get with the luxury package, but I took some pictures of the statue and following a Mesh Labs tutorial I found online, I was able to apply those textures to the mesh. I will link the tutorial video above if you want to try to get the same results that I did. Next, I tried this little plush dog that did decent, I guess, for how hard it really is to scan dark plush material. It was more of a curiosity than anything else, but it turned out pretty good. Next, I really wanted to try out that heat gun that I thought was an interesting model and would be a bit of a challenge, and again, the scanner did a pretty good job. There are some deep holes that could use a little cleanup, but overall a very successful scan. I also find that the longer you work with the scanner, the better your scans become since you end figuring out what works and what doesn't work. You really get an idea of where to focus and how to start combining both the table scans and the handheld scans. It does take a little effort at first, but even in the 13 objects that I have scanned so far, I can tell that my 13th model is much better than my first or even my fifth model. With a little patience and work, you can get some really nice results on capturing those models. Overall, I've been very happy with what I've been able to achieve with the Mole Scanner. Again, this was a night and day difference from my first experience with a 3D scanner over a decade ago. There was not a single model that I attempted so far that I wasn't able to get a satisfactory scan out of. As a 3D modeler, I am trained to be able to recreate some of these things on my own without a 3D scanner, but the time and effort that it would have taken to do that 
would have been really high and it would have been really hard to get the accuracy without a 3D scanner. My only wish was that the scanner by default captured the color texture data at the same time. I could see this being a great tool for scanning props that could be processed and used in game engines like Unreal or Unity, but it really needs that color texture capable component. I wanted to thank 3D Maker Pro for sending me this mole scanner for my honest review. You can also check in the video description below for a promo code just for my viewers from 3D Maker Pro. Thanks again for watching. Also, if you like this video, please do hit that like button and consider subscribing for more videos having to do with 3D scanners, 3D printers, laser engravers, injection molding, and all things Maker. Thanks again, stay safe, and we'll see you next time.